I'm now going to kick off our panel discussion. Um, starting with, I guess, this uh, this issue around demand and, and uptake, and, and we've seen that there have been differing levels of demand for the vaccine. Um, and I'm just wondering what you think has worked well in terms of increasing uptake and, and particularly helping to support people's decisions to, to have the vaccine. Raj, perhaps you'd like to kick us off. So, I mean, this has been a big problem for all of our vaccine programmes. So we recognised last year that we were going to start a flu programme in the autumn and we'd have to do it in a different way from what we're used to. We couldn't have uh, lots of patients packing into GP surgeries. We were going to need to take a coordinated approach. And within that, we recognised that at some point, COVID vaccines were coming. At that stage, we didn't know how soon, but we needed to be prepared for that. And what we knew is that the same patients who are resistant and have low uptake for flu are likely to be the same for COVID vaccine. So we cover a homeless practice, so we knew that they were going to be a difficult and hard to reach group. And we've been working on that for a long time. But actually, we looked at different um, ethnic groups and we found that our Bangladeshi community are often poor uptake and Somali community. Now, what we find is once they're in front of clinicians, often from those backgrounds, um, the uptake very much improves. But what we realise is that we're not doing the recall, we're not the ones calling them in. So what we worked on is um, creating a new team of recallers who are specifically working to um, address some of that vaccine hesitancy look at the reasons and the barriers as to why people didn't want to access the vaccine and we recruited people who um, covered our specific language needs so we had recallers who spoke um, Somali, uh, Bangladeshi and we have a big Kosovan Albanian community who are also sometimes a bit vaccine hesitant and we found that having administrative staff who could speak in the language of the patients often that was the first thing that um, inspired confidence in those patients and encouraged them to take up the vaccine and then that mirrored our clinical population so that could be backed up when they came in for the vaccine as well. Great thank you. Um, any other reflections from the panel? Um, I, I don't mind interjecting at this point I think um, for, for ourselves um, at Barton in wider East London, we were really aware that, um, like many trusts, a lot of your staff are members of the local community as well. So if we were speaking to the local community, it was going to be impacting staff and vice versa. But again, like Raj says, we weren't surprised by what we were seeing, um, and be particularly because of what we'd seen within the um, with flu uptake. But Obviously, as we all know on here, COVID had, it has its own specific nuances, um, and that was really borne out um, in the vaccine uptake. And I think we very much took um, the premise that it was going to be a journey. Um, and for some people, the decision could be made early on, and um, all they required was clarification and reassurance. But for some people, it would take longer. And we really worked to call it out in terms of what were the deep rooted reasons why people didn't want to take the vaccine, but but to be bring it front and center. So to not to be shy to say they were mistrustful of societal structures, not to be shy to say that there's in, embedded inequalities and say that we recognize that we respect it but also respond to it in a, a in a you know kind compassionate um, and a safe and offer safe spaces um, so we offered a number of different um, opportunities for people to convey their concerns and explore them which I think worked really well in terms of you had your standard seminars um, which actually did it salt for um, a big chunk of people but then we matched this with one-to-one um, -one conversations and also um, having our um, our kind of peer champions and peer vaccinators who would go and facilitate these conversations. So there was lots of support at every different level to, to offer people some um, guidance, but then we kept that going. And it, it's, it's just not something that was a flash in the pan because we recognize that it is a journey. 
Vanessa, a question's just popped up in the chat. I'm just wondering if there were any deep rooted concerns that surprised you as part of this kind of discovery process. If I'm really honest, no. <laughs> I think that they're, they're there. The, the issue is, is that we don't, people don't talk about it enough and they often, do, and many people haven't heard it for any particular reason or chosen not to hear it. But everything that people said was justified and um, we've heard it before. And, you know, my personal thing is a lot of things could have been preempted as well. Um, so, yeah. Great, thank you. Sharon, um, would you like to come in and, and talk about the what you think's worked in terms of supporting people to have the vaccine? So, I mean, the way that uh, we have gone about it with the Vaxi Taxi project is to create very kind of bespoke uh, pop-ups de depending on the communities and cohorts that we're trying to appeal to. Um, and I think part of the secret is that it's an event not just focused on vaccination, because for some people that can be worrying and intimidating as though the expectation is if they come onto the vaccination pop-up site, all they're likely to get is a jab in their arm. So what we offer is kind of a, a, a health check, a health assessment. So there might be dentists, physios, podiatrists, um, hepatitis screening, um, we have sexual health uh, support, mental health support, signposting. Um, there's, there is music in the background. It tends to be outdoors in uh, tents. <laughs> I can see Vanessa smiling. She likes it. <laughs> there's goodie bags and there's free lunch for everyone. Um, and so we found that lots of people uh, who are homeless, rough sleepers, sex workers, people with uncertain immigration status. I mean, we've uh, certainly had some pop ups where there's queues, you know, all the way down the road because people know that it's happening that day. Um, and there's absolutely no pressure to have the vaccine. So it's more about having those discussions, you know, exploring what people's concerns are, addressing, you know, any kind of worries because people are entitled to have worries. And, and we want to embrace that and understand it and support their decision making and absolutely not to compel people to have vaccination because that's not a way forward. Um, and so I suppose we have the equivalent of chat zones within the pop up where people can reflect on, you know, whether this is something for them or not. And if they have had a positive experience, and that's certainly borne out by the uh, patient feedback that we've had now from several hundred uh, who've uh, come to these events, you know, hopefully they can go out and be ambassadors to encourage, you know, people within their own communities uh, and contacts to have vaccines. You know, it's just to have the vaccination because it's not it's not that scary, you know, so, so, and also, you know, in the meantime, we're detecting high blood pressures, people with irregular pulses. So there's kind of a, there's an added benefit. And you were talking about, you know, this being a sustainable thing, but so in, including kind of the other health elements to it, I think has been very um, positive. So that's, uh, and it's also working collaboratively with uh, local groups, so not just with health, but um, but also voluntary groups, third sector groups, faith groups. We've had uh, Bishop of Croydon came to one of the pop ups, um, you know, so having kind of faith leaders, people who, uh, you know, you, you have trust in and confidence in uh, there to facilitate some of the discussions has also been uh, really helpful. I do also bring uh, last at the last pop up, I bought about nine bags of donated clothes uh, from the United Synagogue, which went all the way to South London uh, to Turning Point to so the drug and alcohol uh, centre there. Um, so I think it's those kind of things that kind of make it seem maybe less intimidating, less pressured. Um, but it, yeah, it's it's quite a, a big thing to organise, but uh, but the outcomes and the feedback do kind of speak for themselves. That's great, really great to hear. Um, Stephen or Binto, was there anything you wanted to? Stephen, and sometimes these these events we tend to say very similar things, so I, I'll say a little bit, and then maybe Binto might think, oh, that he's missed some things out. Um, <laughs> For us, the journey, the journey, it's probably been, I was just thinking, I think seven months now that Groundswell has been involved in this kind of vaccination conversation, vaccination work. And um, the, the first bit really was, if you cast your mind back when it was all the news around, you would have, you would get your vaccination appointment through GP and then you would go to your vaccination appointment and you get vaccinated. That's how most people get vaccinated. That's how I had my second jab on Monday evening. Um, our role in the beginning was to kind of as a group not groundswell on its own but as a group of people that work with have been working with people who are on this for a long time to say actually be a bit careful with this because a lot of people don't even have a gp 
and even those who do have a GP might not really want to engage in this, um, particularly if they have to go to their appointment. So what we started to kind of push forward a lot was the idea of vaccination outreach, which we've just heard an example of from Sharon, um, which I'm actually going to give a plug for in the London COVID working group, actually, which starts at two o'clock, because I think it sounds like you've done some really good things. And it was a question of us saying, let's take the vaccine to the homelessness settings, because we've got to remember a lot of these settings have quite a lot of people in them. And so it's going to be much more cost effective to start with to take the vaccine there and have you know, a day of getting people vaccinated in, in a hostel or a supported accommodation project. Um, and also it's more likely to be successful because you know people will be there and if you um rather than have them all having to go to individual appointments um but there's been since suggesting that i think there's been quite a lot of learning around the preparation work that needs to go into a site visit um the coordination between health services and the homelessness sector um in particular and actually quite a lot of work which Groundsville has been involved in um, with comms, like tailored communications for people, simple language, you know, from the kind of Groundsville brand that they trust that's been developed by our peers. Um, so there's a lot of learning. You can't just rock up at a homelessness setting and expect everybody to get vaccinated just because you're there, I think is um, is the main piece, is the probably the most simplistic piece of learning. Um, but I'll let Binta say a few things, maybe about peer support on top. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, so in terms of, so I think, yeah, outreach uh, for vaccinations has been key, um, particularly for, as as um, Steve said, for homeless populations who have, you know, poor access to primary care, who have, you know, primary care has, has led the kind of vaccination drive in, in, across the country. And I think it's been particularly challenging for these particular groups. Um, and in terms of what Steve was saying, just to build on um, the importance of the peers and people with lived experience in communicating messages about vaccines, um, and to echo what Vanessa and, and Rajin and was saying as well, um, that's been so important to have that kind of understanding um, of the complexity of the needs and the historical failure of the system to meet those needs as well. Um, and having that really embedded in the outreach vaccination program um, and having the peers alongside us. And also we created a, a model of vaccination which has clinician and peer vaccinators, um, which we found to be really valuable in lots of different ways. So valuable in terms of increasing access and accessibility to people kind of coming down and engaging with the vaccine process, but also empowering those peer outreach workers um, in terms of their skills, but also in terms of the conversations they're able to have, the more kind of nuanced conversations they can have with people around vaccine and vaccine delivery as well. And I think that's been a, a, a key part of our programme. Um, and the other key part has been the preparation, which, which Steve highlighted. Um, the preparation has been so important. So the actual delivery of a vaccine is very easy. Um, you know, it's, it, it takes a, a few minutes, but the preparation time is key and that and you have to let, allow people enough time to absorb the information that you are giving them have individual one-on-one -on -one conversations both with clinicians and peers and to really understand as Vanessa was saying the, the kind of complexity or and very justified anxieties that people have so some of the things that we were here in, in homeless hospital and particularly in emergency accommodation was that People didn't want to have a vaccination because they would um, be seen by the system as no longer at risk of COVID. And so then they would be kicked out, which is a very legitimate concern because we are starting to see that now. And how we address that is we have to be very honest and accept that that is a failure of the system and really think about the individual's needs as well. Um, so, yeah, and the other, I think the other key thing for us is um, as Sharon pointed out, was that every, obviously every individual has their own uh, anxieties and fears or reasons for why they're not or don't want to have a vaccine. But every facility that we visit is different. 
and the needs of that population are different. So every time we turn up at a facility, it, it's different. We have to set up differently. We have to engage differently. And it's being really um, kind of sensitive to that and attuned to that and responding to that each time. Um, and I think that's something probably that inclusion health teams and, and teams that work closely with the communities that they're trying to reach back, you know, outreach vaccinations to probably have a, a more, uh, a, a, probably a better understanding of the importance of that, I think. Great, thank you. And I'm wondering if any of you have seen changes to the demand for the vaccine as the programmes continued and if there's been anything surprising about that? Um, yeah, I mean, from the last the conversation, the last London kind of vaccination working group meeting that I was in last Wednesday, um, it was um, there was a lot of conversation about what seems to be defined as kind of the middle tranche of people. Um, if you in the early days in January, February, there was obviously quite a lot of feel good factor. You go to a hostel where there's 50 residents, half of them get vaccinated on the first visit, you know, and actually but that's kind of the low hanging fruit in a way it's the easy bit because they're the people that are already willing to get vaccinated now the difficulty is going back to those services the difficulty is actually kind of arranging to go back to those services because there tends to be a kind of a little bit of like oh but we've already been there and we're already stretched and we've got limited resource but when you do go back there there seems to be this conversation about the middle group that refused the vaccine in the first place and actually then you go back to a place where you're having a lot of success the first time and the second visit is nowhere near as successful and there's really low uptake. Um, the interesting thing is it's still this conversation about the middle group of people not really kind of actually getting beyond that into the really more difficult, really hesitant um, and actually often quite hard to reach or even find people. Um, but it still seems to be in this middle area at the moment. Sure. Um, Raj or Mara, uh, I don't know which one of you is coming in there. We'll both talk. Raj will go first. So I think um, we've seen really big changes as we've been going through the cohort. So we cover a population of around 70,000 people, very um, diverse. So we've got patients from different socioeconomic backgrounds, from homeless populations to people that live in Hampstead to people around the kind of King's Cross, Somerstown area. And actually we saw very high uniform uptake amongst all our groups, all ethnicities in the over 80s. We hit over 90%, which really surprised us how well we did across the board. And we've seen a steady drop in the numbers as we've got down. And so we've seen in those that are clinically vulnerable, relatively high uptake again, um, and all the way down to 50, we've done pretty well. As soon as we hit the 40 to 50s, we saw a massive drop in the amount of um, people that were uptaking the appointment. So we went down from uh, from being over 90 percent to less than 50 percent. And it's been a real tough um, time to try and get it up. But actually, suddenly, as we have head down into the 20s and 30s, Amara will tell you, mm. we've seen a massive surge again. And um, it's really interesting to see Amara will tell you about our um, what we have when we started to start vaccinating students. So we, um, so it's the difference between some of the outreach services and what we're doing is we're dealing with our registered population, which is huge, um, and we have to be sustainable. And, and the other thing is we've also had to get on with the day job. So we're running our main service. We, st we, were, we were a wave one site, um, so offering Pfizer from our main hub. Um, we were the one of the first 100 sites in the country to go live, but at the same time as we were hitting the second wave, we were also a functioning GP practice. So you can imagine the logistics and the quality assurance that we had to go through for that was a very different challenge to outreach in terms of both volume and numbers and what our workforce was expected to do. So what we've done is we've always been two steps ahead. And I think Jenny's on the call. Um, we've been very good at looking at data. And we don't wait to be asked to do something. We just do it. And we got into a little bit of hot water when we <laughs> thought, well, we're going to we're on student campus. So we are surrounded by University of London and University College London. I can see some of our colleagues are on the call here. So we thought we have to get ahead. We know these kids are going to leave campus and we know we're about to hit a third wave. 
we need to sort of preempt how we get them, particularly the kids who are not registered. So, you know, aside from the homeless population, we've got an international student population around here who and, and, and teenagers and, and youngsters being what they are, they don't normally they don't always register with the GP because it's not a priority. And we thought they're going to travel. So we need to think ahead and get hold of these guys. And, and knowing what we were seeing with, with the sort of 30s and 40s, we thought, you know, they're not going to come forward. So we worked with um, University College of London and thought, you know what, let's let's do a pop up. Let's do a walk in service. And um, we were, were a victim of our own success. So we had about two to three hundred vaccines and thousands of students turned up. It was unbelievable. It was such a positive um, sort of vision but we were just disappointed from our perspective that we just couldn't vaccinate them all but actually what, what we what we've now done is knowing what our demand is we can match our supply and our clinics and we can pre-plan um and you know really target this group knowing that there's that demand so we upped our pfizer orders we've worked with the universities to make sure that we get these people registered we used qr codes we've used social media channels and and it's all of those other things which is a slightly different challenge to you know the, the other sort of more vulnerable populations but you know equally this group are as important because if we're going to get out of the pandemic we've got to look at how people how people move what what are people's demographics what social behavior um so we've faced different sorts of challenges but you know so so positive the social responsibility in the young group coming forward now great um vanessa have you noticed any changes in the the staff uptake as the programs continued so it's interesting, I was just reflecting. So I think um, we we had that middle surge where, every, you know, it was we had our slower trickle and then we did a lot of work and um, a, 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 group, a big chunk of people um, took up the vaccine. And I think really reiterating what Amara said in terms of data. So data has really been at the core to think about the staff groups um, and the different grades and was there any link to that? And that was really important in us refining um, um, what we would do. Um, but I think for us, on a personal note, what was particularly interesting is that as we're coming to, um, as, as we're moving along, um, start, some of the staff that were more um, concerned about taking up the vaccine are being influenced by the younger people within their households. Now, I thought, I have to say, um, and this is kind of anecdotally from a couple of people I was speaking to yesterday, I thought that the younger people would be more of a negative influence and because they were a couple of months ago, but there's been a shift in some of the younger population's mindset about it. And then because of that, staff, some of these staff members are coming in. But again, I think it's just emphasized about making sure you've got the provision to meet to uh, meet the needs of these staff members so when they're ready you're able to say we can see you um so that's been really important and i i think another point just to make is um what's evolved is um people's um I've, I've been sensing um, some defensiveness um in, in a different way because when you've got everyone taking up the vaccine and you're left still contemplating, you do feel that pressure, you do feel that blame and concern and the language and the narrative and media reinforces that. And so um, there have been some core groups that are like, I need the space, um, I'm feeling really anxious here and I don't like where the conversation is going. And once we've given them space, they've then come back and said, I've re I'm rethinking this, um, I'd like to engage. So. Yes, definitely seen some different patterns. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to um, another question. I'm I'm wondering if um, any of you have any ideas about what the key lessons are then for us to learn about future immunisation programmes or broader public health engagement work. Sharon, I can see you nodding. Have you got any thoughts that you want to share? Any lessons, the key lessons? I mean, I think uh, for me, I see uh, the, obviously the vaccination, we all know that that is the light at the end of the tunnel and it's a uh, an end in and of itself. But actually, uh, I think in common with many of my colleagues, I see it as a great opportunity for us to uh, kind of reach out to people who are less or not at all engaged with health um, and uh, and actually, you know, demonstrate that it's not, you know, it's not too frightening, you know, it can help you. And of course, every individual that we help in terms of their health, that's also, you know, helping the wider community. So I think the lesson is, let's make the most of this. 
Um, and uh, and I would say, uh, you know, let's not just focus on on the vaccination, the COVID vaccination, which of course is critical, but let's look at some of the wider things that we can do. Now we have that opportunity with people coming forward and want, particularly those who want to be vaccinated. Um, and so we can use that opportunity very positively for so many other things. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. Great. Does anyone, uh, Binta, yes. Yeah, I was just going to make it, um, so uh, I think a broader lesson that I think we've all learnt, hopefully, um, is through the COVID pandemic and with the vaccination campaign, I think obviously it's highlighted the inequalities of access and and really put a spotlight on, on um, the kind of disproportionate access that some people have. And if we, with new systems, if we develop new si systems that are inclusive, that are accessible and work for the people who are most excluded and most vulnerable if we design systems that have that as a priority then we include everyone from the start and what we've seen with the vaccination campaign is that that didn't happen in the way that it should I think um, and we saw it with COVID and we, we're seeing it time and time again and I think we just need to think bigger and think about when we are developing new systems, new programs of work, that at the very heart of them, and we need to really advocate for that, is that um, that they work for everyone, um, particularly vulnerable populations first. Thank you. And Stephen? Um, a bit tongue in cheek and possibly never achievable. Um, what are the real difficulties with this when you're trying to reach people that are already skeptical about engaging in health services is the just the ridiculous amount of mixed messages in the press um, it's just a constant battle with like you know this has got nothing to do with bill gates and then so that goes on for ages and everybody invests tons of resource into this ridiculous rumor that's just splashed all over the newspapers and then the thing with the blood blood clots and the AstraZeneca jab, it's just, you know, how to take the wind out of the sails of something that's obviously working. Um, and it, it, I know, you, I don't think anybody can really stop the press from doing this. It's just like, the, mix, the mixed messages are just like off the scale. It's, and it is so frustrating. The trickle down to what happens on the front line <clears throat> with those sorts of things that come out in the newspapers, it's just, it's beyond belief how much resource it takes to ratchet it back to the beginning again. Um, but I don't know if there's anything you can really do about that particular problem. No, but being mindful about it being an issue, I guess, and, and being ready to combat these communication challenges with, with uh, the, the true message, I guess. Um, Vanessa. No, great. I completely agree with them, Stephen, but um, yeah. Um, and I, and I, I think I just wanted to um, pick up on what um, Binta was saying, because it, I, I think for me, that is the crux of it, is that um, if you see people and you actively and you intentionally see everyone, you then make systems for everyone. And the problem is, is that the system that has been created has been created for the majority and it doesn't see the minority. And so it, they've got to be actively seen and advocated for. But for me, within COVID, I, the thing is, is that there's so many tools that work and we're seeing them here. And it's just about, I just hope in the learning is um, remembering what we already have, but then also giving resource to what we already have, because the community response, community organisations have been pivotal all through COVID, whether it's provision within food banks and um, clothing cycles supporting education door knocking and then vaccine uptake they've been the crux of it and sometimes i think that 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 their perspective and um support isn't always incorporated in our responses and i think that it, that's something key that we need to learn from amara yeah, I think St Stephen's point's well made. And we, again, this is something we did quite early on. We worked with Health Watch Camden and we worked with some of our community leaders, both faith leaders, Bangladeshi leaders, Somali leaders. Um, and, and Camden Council, actually, for us, have been a really good partner in terms of thinking, how do we reach these groups? And, and we also befriended the media and we've used our social media channels and we invite the media in to say, come on, do some positive positive stories, um, we've written written blogs, we've gone on the radio, we've gone on the TV, I even had a little stint on Bangladeshi TV, 
Um, and our, our Bangladeshi community have the highest uptake in, in our PCN now. So, it, you know, what we've done is say, think, where do people go to get their information? And that's where we need to go. So actually sitting in your consultation room or whatever, talking to that person, they're not going to listen one iota. You go onto social media, say the same thing, suddenly cues of them. So it's it's using the media as well, which we've become, I have to say, if there's a hack, I would say befriend them, start to use them to your advantage. And, and I think we've been, we, we've definitely seen increased uptake by, by doing that. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm gonna move us on to kind of talking about things that you've all been doing to um, make it easy for people to access the vaccine, which uh, you've, you've touched on already um, a lot of you through your work. Um, but yeah, what what are some of the activities? Can you tell us a bit more about the the pop ups um, and 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 all the other activities that you've been involved with, and what you think made them successful? Um, so, over to whoever. Uh, yeah, Amara or Raj. Hi. Right, so um, we recognised very early on that actually, in the same way you're saying you needed to bring the vaccines to your communities, that actually within our populations, we have to do exactly the same. You'd think, okay, we're GPs, we've got practices, you know, people are used to coming to them, but actually we see that sometimes that's a significant barrier to getting people in. We also found that, you know, vaccines couldn't be operated in that usual model. The Pfizer vaccine, it could only come in at one site and had to be delivered out of there. And that's all we had at the beginning. So we realised this again from flu already. So we worked at identifying key sites that would um, work well for our population. So uh, one place that we identified was the living centre at Summers Town, and that hits one of our most deprived communities. And that's a community centre that the local residents are used to accessing. They go there for things like child immunisations, but there's also food bank and, and children's education services. And we started vaccinating uh, in that location and that really increased our uptake. We found that having pop-up um, modules, so we um, uh, bought in some uh, medical porter cabins that we situated in key places. We got sign off from our medicines management team. I think initially they thought like what, what are they, these people doing with these porter cabins and actually we found that they're really key sites as well because particularly some of the elderly population couldn't travel the distance across the borough and maybe a mile is a massive distance for someone to actually travel when they're used to staying in their local community or they need care or provision to bring them or it's used to where they're situated. So identifying these key sites and bringing the vaccines out to them has made a massive difference. That's really improved our uptake um, and it's hitting the key communities that our student population, our homeless population, population, a deprived, um, most deprived area in our borough. It's those areas that we managed to work, uh, work towards and also working with those community partners like the community centres. Just to add one thing to that, we, 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 the Euston Road where we are, and I just put, the, I wrote a blog about it because I thought it was just so unique. People won't cross the road, literally my patients won't go to the other side of the road and patients from the other side of the road won't come to ours. So our hub is on one side of the Euston Road and the living centre is on the other side of the Euston Road. And just having simply that massively changed our uptake, but that was local knowledge. Yeah, it's a big road. It's, it's, a, big road. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big road. <laughs> Sharon. Um, I just want to say, because Raj was touching on the issue of transport um, and... Uh, Obviously, the title of, uh, of the project that I'm engaged with is the Vaxi Taxi project. And part of, uh, you know, part of the kind of way that it works is that we do have uh, a, a black cab uh, or more. Uh, and, and that's a way of kind of transporting people back and forth to the vaccination pop up site for those people who do not want to leave the cab, whether it's for each issues relating to their physical or perhaps mental health or worries about mixing with people, they can have their jab. Uh, within the cab and talking of media there's been quite a bit of media coverage uh, around that both nationally and internationally um, what we also do is use the black cab as a clinical space so we've until now we've been using um, tents mainly with a, a collaboration with the London Fire Brigade using heated tents so then we've got less issues around getting the okay for using particular sites we just pop the tents up um, 
and uh, and also use the cabs uh, in terms of transporting people back and forth, using it as kind of a more discreet and, and kind of quiet clinical area uh, for vaccination. Uh, the last time we used it as a clinical area was uh, when we were vaccinating uh, Zippo's Circus and we had a podiatrist in the vaccine taxi checking people's feet. Uh, so <laughs> so there's, quite, yeah, there's quite a lot of uh, flexibility with, with having that kind of uh, addition, that additional element to it. So I just thought I'd put that in the mix as well. Great. And I wonder actually, um, so there's been quite a lot in the news and, and obviously activity recently with the big surge vaccination events. So it's so a mass, huge scale. Um, and as well as the other kind of smaller pop ups and buses and things like that. And I'm, I'm just wondering what you think about the success of these kinds of models where you're doing on it on a huge scale. And do they do they work for everyone? And how do you balance that kind of sense of scale and, and targeting? There's there's some shaking of heads. Please do come in. I mean, the obvious thing is to say that we, uh, all of us here today, are uh, making the case that actually those mass vaccination sites, surge vaccination and so on, doesn't suit everyone. Um, and we, you know, obviously we want to leave no one behind. So I think that's what we're about. Every individual counts and also every individual that we vaccinate who maybe is from a community or a group. Uh, not very comfortable with vaccination will hopefully go back and tell their story and say actually look this isn't too bad and and uh, and mm. let's just do it so yeah Amara uh, I think it's they, they have a place for opportunistic vaccinating but call and recall for us has been central to our success and, and I think that particularly in general practice we're uniquely placed to do that because we hold the care record um, and where, where we have offered walk-ins, we've encouraged people to register within our network of practices so that we can provide them ongoing health care. So we've used it as an opportunity to do that, even if we haven't been able to provide them health care at that time. But the reason for them arriving was a COVID vaccine. And we've, we've said, please come and join us so that we can then invite you to other things in the future. But more importantly, for the second dose, and we're seeing obviously now with the Delta variant that, you know, two doses is so much better than one. Um, and I guess it remains to be seen, particularly with these mass back sites, how are they doing that call and recall and what is the uptake? Because all of those people that are vaccinated now are going to need a second dose, which requires a huge amount of manpower. And where is that going to be done? Are, are these mass vac sites going to be able to continue or these pop ups going to be, be able to continue? You know, there's a question of sustainability there for me, and particularly where we're potentially being having to offer booster doses later because we're not sure where the immunity is. And certainly from our perspective, it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And we're thinking flu now as well. So we're not just thinking COVID vaccinations, we're thinking COVID vaccinations three plus the massive flu programme that we're going to embark on in September. So, uh, yeah, it, it's 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 got it's got its pros and cons. Binta. Yeah, so I was just going to echo some of the points. I think it is helpful to have just as many options as possible for people so that you can have that opportunistic vaccination. Um, I think Amara's point is, is key, though. It's those, you know, even people access their first dose, the second dose is, is an issue. So we were out vaccinating in the Strand last night, um, uh, vaccinating rough sleepers in the Strand. And there's a huge number of people who were well, who had had their first dose of AZ at, in January and still hadn't had their second dose. And there are more and more people like that who just, you know, they've had their first dose, they're not, and they don't know how to access the second dose. They don't, they, it's really difficult to do it online, especially if you don't have your NHS number. It's not easy to access. So these, these pop ups are useful, but I think the follow up um, is, is a challenge, and that's something that, that really needs focus. The other thing I just wanted to say is we really need to move. Um, shift away and I think we will do eventually from a campaign approach to a more of a continuous offer for people. Um, I think the campaign approach has been great in, in kind of vaccinating lots of people at once, but it also has put a lot of pressure on, on vaccination on teams, but also on individuals. And a lot of individuals just just can't just don't want to deal with that and just just would rather just say no than have a conversation. And if we can embed the vaccine into our kind of regular work, so it's just a continuous effort for people. I think it's that that's where we should be shifting to.
Thank you. Vanessa. Oh. Yeah, again, um, always great to come on panels like this because you're you're with the converted. So I <laughs> completely agree with everything that everyone said. And I think for me, um, plurality of options is so important. But what it, it's again, what's been articulated, it's just being clear that it's not job done. And the problem is, is that in the media sometimes, uh, uh, not bashing the media, but it's actually in a lot of, you know, in my family, they were talking about, oh, great, you know, they're doing it in Excel. Oh, great, it's all sorted. And it's just being clear that it's an offer for some that some may really respond to. But like we're saying, it's got to be the second dose. It's got to be about thinking about boosters. And it's also being recognised that whilst many went, many didn't go. And where are the people that didn't go? Um, and so feeding that and to countering that message of positivity, which is great, but just still acknowledging that there's still a lot of work to do. Lovely. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious of time so I'm going to move on to, to my last question which is really kind of looking at the issue of inequality so the the, the vaccine program and you've you've touched you've all touched on this it's it's highlighted inequalities across the system some of which we we knew already existed but some that have emerged as the programs continued so what do you think the main lessons are for us when we think about longer term planning? Is there anything that we can take from the work that you've been doing and apply elsewhere? Stephen. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the expert, the health inequality stuff that's been kind of had a light shone on it through the vaccination program is builds on the light that's already been shone on the issues during the everyone in um, work over the last year or so. You have obviously very sizable population in in London and obviously in other urban centres of people that are either sleeping rough or in very precarious housing situations um, that have all benefited from being brought into into what's been called the hotels and um, and then I mean particularly work that was done by find and treat through a kind of health assessment was that it was really obvious that there are lots of people that just don't engage in health services at all they don't even have a GP they've probably never been to see a doctor for years and um, they might have a range of health problems severe and less severe that just aren't getting dealt with um, so keeping the spotlight on that I think is going to be really important um, and some of the stuff that Sharon said I think is really important when you it's not just about going to the Excel Centre to get vaccinated. It's actually about going to something that's a bit more holistic in the hope that somebody might get vaccinated, but might also get their foot looked after or registered with a GP or start to engage in other services, because that's how you're going to chip away at the inequalities that they face. Um, so that's one thing. <clears throat> and I think the other thing in terms of longer term planning, which would be a decent piece of work and would make life much easier <laughs> is an education on both sides of the health sector and the housing sector and the housing services or the homelessness sector um, or even maybe just local authorities to understand what each side does and how they could work together and how they could fit together and how they could support each other because sometimes you go to a, a, a meeting that you know is supposed to be about how to do vaccination outreach and you spend half the time talking about the definition of homelessness and what does it actually mean to be homeless um, and it's just you know it's not really against anybody it's just that people just don't know they don't understand um, and if you're gonna if we are going to work together to end inequalities you're going to have to start with the workforce having a deeper understanding of all the different sides of what happens um rajamara Hi, I think one of the things that are really highlighted to us is that how many people are unregistered and don't have GPs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we sort of targeted, you mentioned the homes, we thought, OK, they'll, they'll be unregistered. But what we found is there's so many people that are not accessing healthcare. So whether that's students, our health workers, we're right next to UCH. When we started off trying to vaccinate the health workers, mm -hmm. so many of them didn't have an NHS number because they've never accessed a, a GP or A&E mm. in the UK um, or even a lot of them had NHS Scotland numbers which we didn't realise was going to be problematic um, until we got to those patients. Uh, people in multi-generational families so what we're finding is that perhaps grandmas are registered 
and the babies are registered, but actually the adults aren't. So mum and dad aren't registered or one parent is. So mum's registered because the baby's registered, but dad isn't. And so actually dad's not being invited for any sort of health care or, you know, there might be auntie living with them. And actually she's never had a smear test or a mammogram because nobody's inviting them to these public health campaigns. There's a whole hidden population of people who are generally quite well who are going to be a problem in 20 30 years because they've not accessed healthcare up until this point and it's a group that nobody's looking at because they're not identified as high risk they're not identified as homeless or you know a difficult group to access they're just ordinary people who just aren't registered or never have been classic 50 year old men that have never been to the GP ever, you know, and those people that are never going to get any kind of screening. And what's really helped is they've registered for the vaccine. And so now we can start accessing them for other things, other health promotion, other screening services. And hopefully this will lessen the burden later on because these are all our late presenters for cancer and other health conditions. Thank you, Vanessa. No, completely agree. And I think um, one of the things is that with um, uh, just in this greater light on health inequalities that we've been seeing for how long, um, I, I think often when you hear about inequalities and social justice issues with that, so, sometimes it can feel insurmountable. Um, and, you know, how do you make a difference? And I think what COVID and what the vaccine work has shown is that you can make a difference. Um, and and I, that's you know nothing really more to say. I, I think that because I think that that's something that gets lost in it is that people feel you 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 do sessions on health equity and you're explaining to colleagues etc. And then you can see that kind of gulp of thinking where do you begin? And actually you can just begin in your corner and start something small and it can make a real difference. And um, I just think the vaccine work has been fantastic for illustrating that. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah, absolutely uh, uh, agree with everything that's been said. I just want to make the point that uh, there are, and I'm sure you'll all agree, there are a lot of people out there, maybe not, uh, I don't know how, what the numbers are, but people who are not engaging with health because they don't want to. Um, and I think it is about respecting people's choices. People do have fears. And of course, it's amazing if we can achieve allaying their fears and, and showing them that this is not, you know, frightening or worrying to access health and it's beneficial beneficial for themselves. But even notwithstanding that, I think as Vanessa pointed out before, there's some people who hear about vaccination, they'll say, I'm thinking about it. At least if they think about it, you know, we've done something good. Mm. But obviously we can't, you know, we can't compel them. We can't imp impose our choices on them because, you know, very central to everything that we do is patient autonomy. Uh, but I think what's really key here is going out to people, uh, you know, reaching out literally physically uh, <laughs> and, uh, mm. and, and, in, and in all the other ways that we are doing. Um, and I think that really makes a meaningful difference. It's just it's a start on that road of, of making things, you know, more uh, more accessible. So. I just wanted to add that, that, uh, yeah, it's ultimately it's about patient choice. Thank you. And Binta. Uh, just to follow on from what Sharon was saying, that there are um, a whole proportion of people who are afraid to engage with the system and which are, and they have legitimate fears. So we vaccinated um, several undocumented migrants who were just too scared to approach GPs too scared to approach to even go to A and E because of um, uh, the hostile environment, um, and I think we really need to recognise that and do what we can to to reduce those barriers and to to make it a safe space for people um, to engage with healthcare. So it's one thing to to ask people to engage, but we need to make it a safe space. For Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that's a really nice note to um, to, to end on. Actually, we're, we're just at time. Um, so huge thanks to the panel. Um, it's I found it such an inspirational conversation and, and thank you for all the work that, that you've been doing. And, and it, I, I suspected there was going to be a lot of kind of crossover of themes and and of the work that you're doing and, and that proved to be the case. So thank you for your time. Thanks to everyone who who joined us. Um, I hope you found it useful and interesting and um, hope to see you all again soon. So thank you very much. <laughs>